Well, good morning, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and open this in prayer this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day to come together in your name to worship your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we, we thank you for this time to, together to dig into your word, to understand what you would have us learn, to be able to apply it, that we would be a church that is active and sharing the gospel and your love and, and in the glory of your Son in the power of the Spirit. Father, we thank you for what we will study today. Would I ask that you would use me to just be your vessel. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, I made you wait one more week before we get to the 70 weeks. And hubris, on the drive here, I said to Christy, yeah, you know, I put the 70 weeks off for another week, not even really thinking about what I was saying. Um, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So, um, so when I was looking at when I was looking at chapter nine, um, there's a lot in chapter nine. Certainly, the second half of chapter nine is the section that gets most attention because of the prophecy of the seventy weeks. We will be there uh, next week. That's what I'll cover. But I did want to dig into Daniel's prayer today um, because it, it is such a one meaningful and beautiful prayer, but also one that we can look at, dig apart, and maybe learn something from. So uh, today we'll be in Daniel 9, verses 1 through 19. So um, the people of God are marked by humble confession and great confidence in the righteousness and faithfulness of God. John Owen, who is a uh, Puritan uh, theologian, said, what an individual is in secret on his knees before God, that he is and no more. So when you hear that, like what does that, what does that mean to you? Like when, when an individual is in secret on his knees before God, that he is and no more. And that, that was a real poignant quote, and that's why. So what, do you, what, is that, what does that mean to you? It talks about a person's character, who they really are whether they're in the light or in the dark, it reveals their heart. Okay, yeah, certainly it's a heart character. Very people are really, really 100% real. Um, you know, Certainly there is, a, there is a guardedness that we have when it comes to really being who we are, right? So again, another conversation had this morning, something that from a business standpoint, a big focus for my company right now is being your authentic self, right? So opening up and being vulnerable, letting people know who you are, being real, right? Um, but how much of that is really what people want when they talk about being authentic? I'll be honest with you, you know, Christy and I, I've been, I've been, you know, certainly you've seen that I've made some choices lifestyle-wise to have something permanently put on my arm. When we did this study in Ephesians, I was really moved by Ephesians chapter 2, but beyond just that, Ephesians 10, 2.10, because... Yeah, we talk a lot about by grace you were saved, that you won't be boasting because it had nothing to do with you. But we don't go on and continue to say and understand that salvation makes you God's masterwork. That he made so that you would walk in the good works that he's prepared beforehand. We should be active because of it. And so I've taken that to heart and my authentic self is one that is actively sharing the love of God with people. So it has given me a chance to be more, more what God intended me to do, his instrument. And so, you know, you think about being authentic. You, when you are on your knees before God, there's nowhere you can hide. Like you are, you are there. That is what you are. Whether in your mind you're trying to be something else, but in front of God, in the light of his holiness, that is who you are. 
And, and the more that you can recognize that and come to grips with it, the more that your prayer life can be real and authentic and help you to c come after and help go after some of the changes that you'd like to do. So let's take a second. Do we need to get some chairs back there, y'all? Yeah. We get we got chairs here. We can move. We got a front row ready to go. <laughs> y'all scared about that? Not many people want to come get up that close. Trumbles are scared to be in the front row. They've seen the they've seen the um, projectiles. Just so. the back of your head. Thanks. I No, 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 no worries, no worries. I'll just set the clock back again. Yeah. He was already five minutes back, so I'll just. <laughs> so, so we're talking about in chapter nine. We're doing the prayer of Daniel. So, Daniel nine uh, one through nineteen is considered to be one of the most remarkable prayers in all of Scripture. So, when you think about those prayers that stand out, this would be one of them. What are some other prayers in Scripture that really you remember? John 17, the great priestly prayer. The prayer of Jabez. The prayer of Jabez. We had, we had books and oh, gosh, yeah. tote bags and throw pillows about the prayer, prayer of Jabez. Wasn't Nehemiah having Nehemiah. Nehemiah's prayer, yeah. <clears throat> Ezra. Ezra, right? What about Moses' prayer? Oh, yeah. For people. Yeah. Right? So there have been, what about David's prayers? I mean, we have a whole book of them. Yeah. <laughs> But one in particular, you know, Psalm 51, his prayer of, of petition to God for forgiveness. Um, so, you know, there are some of these some great big prayers. Daniel's prayer is one of them. Um, so the prayer runs really kind of on two tracks. There's the corporate confession of sin. So seen as a model prayer of how to pray for a nation, but even more for a rebellious community of faith. And we'll get into some of that. And then... Second track being recognition of the greatness, awesomeness, righteousness, and holiness of God, right? So everything's seen as an expression of the character of Yahweh. So we're, we're going to dig in and we're going to see that in Daniel's prayer. Um, so, oops, sorry, I went backwards. So charge, Charles Spurgeon, right? You guys have heard of Charles Spurgeon? Um, this, is what he had, he, this is what he said. He said, a true-hearted believer does not live for himself. Where there is abundant, where there is an abundance of grace, a great strength of mind in service of God, there is sure to be a spirit of unselfishness. Daniel's prayer should, by the blessing of God's spirit, inspire us with the spirit of prayer, and his example in forgetting himself and remembering his people should help us to be unselfish and lead us to care for our people, even God's people, to whom we have the honor and the privilege to belong. I think it's a challenge to us when it comes to our prayer life as to where our focus is. And, you know, that doesn't mean that we don't focus on ourselves. Certainly there are things that we come to God and petition, but there's there are greater things that we can impact for God's kingdom. If we remember, going back to Ephesians again, our impact isn't in the here and now. It's in the heavenly places. And so that is accomplished also in prayer. So if you wouldn't mind, if someone would, uh, if you'd open your Bibles to Daniel 9, um, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to read Daniel's prayer. And I broke it up into three sections. If someone would like to read 9, 1 through 3, and then someone read 9, 4, 4 through 14, and then 9, 15 to the end of 19. I read one to three. Go ahead. Knock it out. In the first year of Darius, the son of uh, that guy, by descent Amid, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord, Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer, and pleased for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I'll take four on, and I prayed to the Lord my God, and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned 
committed iniquity, acted wickedly, and rebelled, even turning aside from thy commandments and thy ordinances. <clears throat> Moreover, we have not listened to thy servants, the prophets, who spoke in thy name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Righteousness belongs to thee, O Lord, but to us open shame, as it is this day to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those who are nearby and those who are far away, and all the countries to which thou hast driven them, because of their unfaithful deeds which they have committed against thee. Open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. The Lord, our God, belong compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Nor have we obeyed the voice of the Lord, our God, to walk in his teachings, which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. Indeed, all Israel has transgressed thy law and turned aside not obeying thy voice, so the curse has been poured out on us, along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. Thus he has confirmed his words, which he had spoken against us, and against our rulers who ruled us, to bring on us great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what was done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to thy truth. And I'll stop at 14. Does anyone want to read the last section? Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> and now, O Lord our God, who have brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, as it is this day, we have sinned, we have been wicked. O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. So now, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplication. For your sake, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see your desolation and the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications because you, uh, before you on account of any merit of our own, but on account of your great compassion. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and take action. For your own sake, O oh my God, do not delay because your city and your people are called by your name. All right. Thank you. So it's kind of long, right? There's a lot of things to remember there. But we're going to start in, in verses 1 and 2. So in the first year of Darius, the son of Asuras, by descent of Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the numbers of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. So, this is a prayer that flows from the study of the Word. So, verse 1 provides a historical marker for us, right? So, the first year of Darius the Mede, who was also known as Cyrus the I of Persia. So, last week when we went through and we talked about, you know, the, the Medes and the Persians... Um, you have Cyrus who comes and he conquers Babylon. So this is the first year under the new regime, right? This is the first year with a new ruler and uh, Cyrus the first or Darius the Mede. So this is 12 years after the last chapter's vision. So 12 years have passed. So that makes Daniel now 80 years old or more than 80 years old. So um, he, if you think about it, he was a youth when they were taken into exile, and now he has been there through the different kings, right? And Christy reminded me last week that it is prophesied that it would be to the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, and then there would be this change. So 
you know, we have now Daniel who's been there for a long time under Babylonian rule, but God has been preserving him and God has been blessing him, much like, much like we see in Joseph. No matter what he did, God was with him and he was put in these places. So it was, and we learned last week that Daniel does become the chief advisor to Cyrus. So in his first year, Daniel, Daniel's having this prayer. So um, Daniel perceived in the books a number of years according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely the 70 years. So Daniel's read the book. Daniel knows the outcome. Much like when we looked back last week and we said, okay, Medes and Persians, we know this comes to pass. Greeks, we know this comes to pass. Um, you know, and then we were able to look and see the four kingdoms that came out and go all the way through Antiochus and say, okay, this lines up. It's historically accurate. It was something that happened. Daniel's reading here with an expectation. He has been in Babylon for a while. And he's reading Jeremiah and he's being reminded that the desolation of Jerusalem is to last 70 years. So it, it, Jeremiah 25 uh, says, This whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will be when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and the nation, declares the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it an everlasting desolation. I will bring upon that land my works, my words, which I have pronounced against it, all that is written in this book which Jeremiah has prophesied against the nations. For many nations and great kings will make slaves of them, even them, and I will re recompense them according to their deeds and according to the works of their hands. And then later in Jeremiah we see, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future hope. So when you think about it, Jeremiah has basically said, this is going to happen. Then I'm going to bring judgment on the Babylonians. And when the 70 years are fulfilled, I know the plans I have for you. I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to restore your future and restore your hope. So this is, this is where Daniel is. He is in, he's reading, and this moves him to this prayer. So he considered, right, he, he also considered Jeremiah to be scripture, right, because he calls it the books, and the word of the Lord. Had the canon been put together at this point? No, it hadn't. Hadn't. So we don't have an official canon, but what Daniel's saying is this is God's word. This is scripture. Much like we see when we the reference of Paul's letters is being scripture. So in the moment, contemporaries would have looked at this and said, This is God's word. This is something that is holy scripture because it comes from one of God's holy prophets. Um, and he also knew, right, looking back, and we're going to see some of this, and I'm going to set the context, that the judgment of, the, of Israel was pronounced in Scripture. In Deuteronomy, all right, so Deuteronomy 15 through 68, I'm not going to read all of it, all right? But I'm going, to hit, I'm going to hit some of the high parts. It says, but it shall come about, if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe and to do all his commandments and his statutes with, with which I charge you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And then we go on for about 20 verses with all the curses that will come. So it's good to go and, and read and see what they are. The Lord will bring you and your king whom you have, you have set over you. So some important things to understand there. So if we understand the history of Israel, God says, no king, I'm your king. The people come and say, no, we want a king. And they choose their own king. And then it starts to be that way. They start to choose their own king, who they've said to you. 
and then to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. I just want to stop here for a minute. You will serve other gods. Not, you might serve other gods. You will be asked to serve other gods, but you will refuse. You will serve other gods. Did we see that in the Babylonian exile? We, we hear the stories of Daniel and his friends, but there were hundreds of thousands of Jews in Babylon. Did every Jew stand? Did every Jew protest? So we, we do see that coming about. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as the eagle, no, eagle swoops down, there's that eagle again, a nation whose language you shall not understand, a nation of fierce countenance who you will have no respect for the old, nor show favor to the young. Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all peoples, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone, which you and your fathers have not known. Among those nations you shall find no rest, and there will be no resting place for the sole of your foot. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and despair of soul. So, Daniel, in this moment, reads Jeremiah, and he says, hey, the 70 years are up. But then reflecting back, like, why did we even end up here? Well, Moses told us why we were going to end up here. It is because we did not obey the Lord your God. Done. To observe his commandments and his statutes. Statutes, not statutes. So we have here Daniel put in this position, knowing what scripture says, having the hope that comes, and it brings him to prayer. So he has expectations, right? Israel has been judged like Deuteronomy to warrant. Israel has been taken by the Babylonians, as Jeremiah clarified, and the time of 70 years is coming to an end. So again, Daniel was taken captive in 605 BC. It's now 538 BC. So that's 67 years have passed. What scripture says is what God says, and what God says happens. So, 67 years. So in three years, we should be looking for restoration. And this has Daniel both encouraged, but also troubled. Because God's promises are not conditional or, or potential, they do come to pass. Daniel believes the prophecy in Jeremiah. He has seen the judgment of Deuteronomy, and he has moved to prayer. And, and only as we deepen our understanding of God as revealed in the Bible will our praying become richer and more soundly based on who God is. So then we move to, chapter, to verse 3. So we have the historical context set. We understand what has, what has come to pass in that time. And then it says, Daniel, uh, Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy, with fasting and sackcloth, and ashes. Prayers take us humbly into the presence of God. Going back to that, that, that quote that I put at the beginning to set the context is, we are who we are when we are on our knees before God. And, in, and if you really reflect on who you are against the holiness of God, there is, no other, there is no other reaction but humility. You don't come to God like, yeah, that's right. I'm awesome, and when we're done with this, I'll even be more awesome. Right? It is an understanding that you are meeting with the creator of the universe, and this is not something to be taken lightly. I did want to say, you know, turn my face. So this, this idea in Hebrew, right, turns his face, is that Daniel looks to God and focuses on him in earnestness, right, in earnestness. And also this turning, right, that word shuv means to repent. So in the turning of his face, not only is he turning and focusing on God, but there's a turning in his spirit that says there's repentance that's, that's acting here. So that idea of shuv, the turning, 
is that that idea that as we go forward, we're going to see visible laments. So prayers and pleas, what are those? What are prayers and pleas? They're cryouts, okay? Cryouts. I think of hopes and dreams. That'd be a you know one way to put it. But I think that's a you know it is it is light, but certainly they are you know Daniel's hope, hope in God, hope for the future, and his ideas, his his plea to God's holiness, to God's word, to God's faithfulness to remember his name, and we're going to look at that as we go forward. So we get into fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So, fasting. So withholding food from the body for the sake of prioritizing something else. Have, have, have any of you ever fasted for a number of days for the purpose of prayer or, or something? What happens? You pray all the time. You pray all the time. Why? Like, you are reminded, physically, that you're in a state that requires you to focus your attention not on who you are, but on God. It is a reminder. It is a physical reminder. Think about Jesus going into the wilderness for 40 days and fasting. I mean, 40 days. That's, I can't make 40 minutes <laughs> some, most days, right? So, he's there and he's fasting, and his reliance at that point is solely on God, right? And if you think about it, when Satan says to him, you could turn these stones to bread, and he says, man does not live by bread, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. So it focuses you back on God, on his word, and it puts you in a physical state of neediness. So, sackcloth. Have you, Sackcloth was like a rough material. I always saw it as um, like burlap. Have you ever put burlap on? Like, but as I did a little research, it was most likely made from animal skins. So, you know, think about it. John the Baptist. He wore what kind of cloak? Camel hair. Camel hair, right? So the camel hair cloak was meant to be rough and meant to be make you uncomfortable. That's why when you see monks going into cloister they put on those they put on those those rough cloaks it's so that there isn't a physical comfort um, so that rough material made from skin so think about it, if you turn the skin on the inside and it's that rough inside and that's what you're wearing um, it, it would have been an irritant and again a sign of repentance right a sign that that there was something that that needed to remind you that this is rough and I need to turn from this um, so wasn't that also worn for mourning periods? It was, yes. Yeah. But in a mourning period, right, it would have also there would have been a call to repentance there as well. In in you know, in your mourning of loss, like to get you right, to get you where you needed to be, to be in God's presence. And and so the mourning would be seen as joy in God. And that's and that's that's from Basil of Caesarea. Right, so that idea of bringing up the idea of mourning, and and mourning in in being uncomfortable was really, you know, to be get you right with God. So there is an aspect of repentance in it. And then ashes, ashes symbolize complete ruin. So by putting ashes on your head, you are completely ruined. You are without any sort of attractiveness. There is nothing valuable. You are completely ruined. So it is, it is a physical manifestation and state of utter repentance, reliance, and focus on God. So you have Daniel who has done this. So that posture shows a, shows a man solely focused on God with a burden he could hardly bear. And so when you, when you, when you go through... And you read this prayer, you know, we talked about other prayers. There was one prayer that I didn't hear you mention that when I was doing this, it made me think of. And that was in, and I, I'm going to take Luke here. It says, and it came out and went, as was custom to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. 
And when he came to a place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And they withdrew from them, and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. We have Jesus here, removed, alone, and in agony, praying. In, in, this, in this position before his Father of humility and seeking and certainly at this point understanding that it's not his will but it's God's will that will be done and that's what he's seeking in the prayer. And that's, that's what we're going to see as we move forward in Daniel as well. Do you need to come in? Come on in. So as Daniel and Jesus entered into prayer humbly, it's a reminder of how we should approach God, right? And I think a lot of times we get very joyful and we're like, we, we have this ability to enter into God's presence, right? And so, so while Jesus has given us the ability to enter God's presence, right, this was according to the eternal purpose that he was realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. We have this ability to enter God's presence with boldness. But where does that ability lie? In our, in our advocate, the high priest. Hebrews 4, 14, 11. Absolutely. So we be, I go back to Ephesians. How many times did we read in Ephesians? In Christ in Christ. So it is in Christ that we have the ability to enter God's presence. And that's a bold move to, to think that you would enter into God's presence by yourself. That's like the high priest entering behind the veil and doing the things that he shouldn't be doing because we're sure to bring profane fire before the Lord. But when we're in Jesus, we have that ability to approach him with boldness. But still, humility should be our posture, right? So he has told you, old man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So I mentioned previously the prayer was broken up into two themes. So there was the corporate confession of sin and the acknowledgement of God's character. And so as we go through... Right, as you see this, some of this may sound familiar to you because Daniel sprinkles his prayer with allusions to Scripture. So Leviticus 26:40 is, but if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers in their treachery that they have committed against me and also in walking contrary to me. Deuteronomy, and I already went through that, so I'm not going to read it again. Um, Exodus, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord a God merciful and grace, gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers of the, on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. You have made us a byword among the nations, a laughingstock amongst the people. And then, again, Jeremiah, we see here that he will allude to Jeremiah. So I throw those things out there to kind of give you the idea. You know, Daniel's prayer is one that is soaked in where he is, but also in God's word, in the power of God's word, in the promises of God's word, both those promises that weren't so great to hear, but also those promises that are great to hear and to give us hope um, because if you think that you're struggling God told you that you would if you were joyful in God God told you you would be joyful in God it's in scripture and in this prayer we see Daniel alluding to those things and and, and really talking through it we're going to get to a, a, I'm going to talk about it a little bit but 
think about some of the things we've seen, like already we heard a reference to the Exodus. How many times in Scripture, in prayer, or in prophecy, has someone made an allusion to God's work in Egypt? Israel understood that they were a nation and a nation restored and chosen because of God's work in Egypt. He said to them and took them in the desert and said, you will be mine. And he also told them what would happen when they didn't listen and obey. So understanding, again, well, if we're in the word, the word will fuel our prayers. The word will instruct our hearts on what our posture should be when we approach God. He's given us the context. He's given us the words. We should understand in there as we seek God who he is, what his promises are, and what he has done. And in that, we can understand where we don't meet God's measure but also rest in the promises that he's given us. So it's with that that we'll, we'll get into it. So three movements. Verse four, we see adoration, right? So verse four says, um, sorry, I can't find it. I, I, I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who, are, who love him and keep his commandments. So it starts with a recognition of God's greatness, of God's steadfast love. What is that steadfast love? His chesed, right? His covenant faithfulness. If there is nothing more powerful in scripture than God's covenant faithfulness, because he upholds the covenant no matter how badly we do, so it is in that moment that Daniel says, it is on that, oh great God, that we rest. And there's adoration that, blow, that comes from it. Then in verses 5 through 14, we have confession. And I'm going to dig in a little bit more around there. And then chapter, and in verses 15 through 19, we have those petitions, those pleas. So I don't know if you did this, but notice the number of times we, or our, or us, is found in Daniel's prayer, right? So the, the idea of some sort of corporate ownership. So Daniel isn't saying, y'all. He isn't saying those guys. He's saying us, right? So 24 times in verses 4 through 19, you will see that corporate language used. So Daniel, Daniel confesses the reality of his sin and the people's sin because he has been called out to carry their burden as his own, even though he did not cause the burden. He is responsible for the people under his care. So I just want to stop for a second. You could be sitting there saying, okay, well, I don't have a nation under my care. I don't have these great burdens to bear. So what does this mean? There are people under our care. We are part of a family. We are part of a church. And, is, and if we don't carry the burden for our brothers and sisters in Christ, then we are not fulfilling what it means to be a church. It is a we exercise. It's as y'all, all y'all are going, that you make disciples. It's not just us. It's not just me standing alone. It is us together. It is us living in a gospel society, living the gospel for the world to see. And then we can only do that if we have all things in common, and that would be our prayer life as well. So if we're not praying for one another, if we're not bearing each other's burdens and so fulfilling the law of Christ, then... We need to really think about what it means to be a part of a church. I'm going to go back to what I talked about earlier with Ephesians. 
yes, you can focus on yourself and say, by grace I am saved. But there's an activity that is drawn out of that salvation that we would go, that we would go together because the vehicle that God has chosen to change the world is the church. And if we're not praying for the church, then we need to really think about the we aspect of our belief. And then also, we live in a nation. It impacts us. How do we impact it if we don't pray for it? We live in a world. How do we impact the world if we don't pray for it? It is the power of the Spirit moving on the, on the prayers and petitions of God's people that can bring about change. So if we don't think about our burden as being a corporate one, then let's start thinking that way. Sure, there are individual things that we fall on our knees before God that we're struggling with, that we need his help, that we need his love and guidance in. But we should never forget that we are part of a greater body. Terry, when you said all things in common, my mind immediately went to Acts, the opening verses, right after Pentecost. And it says, the first church, the model, the way it should be, they had all things in common under the authority of the apostles, in the word, praying together, eating together, and they were being blessed day by day, and sat with miracles and thousands added. It's so simple, the basic model. All things in common. Where there was a need, there was no. And I, and I did that on purpose, <laughs> to draw you back to Acts, that, that when that body gathered together, it wasn't about my ministry or this, it was about we're together under the Lord Jesus Christ our head. Do we really think that way? If we don't pray that way, that would be an indication that you don't think that way. It's a good challenge to us. So let's go through and look at the sins of this scribe. And I, and I cut the verses down and just highlighted the sins. So we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside. So rebelling, turning aside. So remember, we saw at the beginning, right, this idea of Daniel turning his face, the idea of shuf being one of repentance. The opposite of shuv is the turning away, turning aside, and that's rebellion. It's not turning toward God, it's turning away from God. We have not listened Treachery committed against you. We have sinned against you. We have rebelled. We have not obeyed. We have transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice, which we sinned against God. He, we, not, we did not entreat the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. We did not obey his voice. We have sinned. We have done wickedly. Any themes in there? <laughs> what, do you, what do you, what do you, when you read that, like if you just condense it down to the things that we, that we did or didn't do, what is it? I will be your God, and you will be my people. We did not put God at the center. The Israelites did not put God at the center. What's even more amazing about this is, where are they doing this? In the land. Which land? No. Well, now they're in Babylon. He's praying now. In the 70 years, or the 67 years, as we're getting ready, in the 67 years we've been in Babylon, look at what we've done. They did look out there. Did anything change? They just picked up the show and moved it to another town. The circus just moved, that's all. There was no learning, there was no growth, there was no repentance. 
I, I bet the first couple weeks there were. But then they got comfortable. They set up their lives. In fact, I read in, in, in Jeremiah, right, and I read in Deuteronomy that Deuteronomy says that there would be those who would remain scattered. After the return, right, if we're looking at history, did all the Jews go back to Israel? Only a small handful. I believe Isaiah said it this way, a remnant returns. Only a small handful went back to Israel. The rest were like, man, I got this nice house. My kids are in this school, and I got a job over here at the, at the idol factory. I really, you know, I'm good. Like, God's great, and I, and I love God, but I, I'm, I got to stay here. Like, I'm not going back. Yeah, you fully assimilate, right? You fully assimilate to your surroundings, uh, way of life. It's easy. Talk. No, I still prayed toward Israel. I did. I turned to Israel. I prayed. But you're not listening. You're not obeying. You're not living as though God is real. No, but I did the stuff I was supposed to do. But to your, to your initial, so the last conversation before this was that from the very beginning it was meant to be a community. And it's, it's like the weird thing we have now, which is like I can be a Christian and watch things on TV and listen to podcasts but not be in community. You know, from the very beginning, there was something wrong. Man was without woman. He didn't have community. It, you know, God's promise to Abraham, I'm going to do this through a great people. You get to Mount Horeb and Moses, it's, it's with the people. And now you're in, you're in exile, and you're like, ah, maybe I'm, you know, if you guys go back, but I'm going to figure this thing out myself. And, like, for the Jews especially, worship happens. It's, it's nice to have the synagogue, but you have access to the temple. At this time, yeah. not yet. <laughs> not yet, but you're going to have access to the temple, the, the place where God dwells. Yeah, and should they have had that expectation? That God was going to deliver them back to the... Yeah. yeah and that the temple would be... We, we went through that last week. Right. Isaiah says it. He says, I will restore my temple on my holy hill. When Cyrus, my instrument, brings you back to the land. So... You have this idea that all of the things... So, were they in Scripture? Did they understand? Or had they just been like, all right, I'm Jewish and this is what happens. And here we are, we're set up a life, we're going to make the best of it. Without really relying on God or His Word. So, so when you see this, right? Daniel's put in the position of being the prosecutor. He's built an irrefutable case against the people. Like... You were punished, you were brought here to serve your punishment, and you haven't changed. Against those who are called by his name. Because the Babylonians still saw them as outsiders. They were still Jews. And they were doing these things. But he also includes himself, right? So we talked about the we language. Um, reminds me of Jeremiah, of Isaiah, right? Where Isaiah is brought before God, and his first response is, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So if you think about what we've seen to this point, right? Daniel is the one who is blessed. Daniel's the one, along with his friends, who say, We're not going to eat at the king's table. We're not going to bow to the statues. I'm not going to stop praying, throw me in with the lions. Everything's cool, right? I've done what I'm supposed to do. And yet Daniel says, even I don't measure. Even I don't. There have been, there, I, I can't, in the light of God's holiness, say, I got it. I got it. So he highlights the actions of the people who have broken their commitment to a God who entered into covenant with them, right? So, thinking about all the, there was one, there's this passage in Ezekiel that made me think of what that covenant looks like. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at an age for love, and I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine. What does that sound like? Yeah, 
Yeah, it does. I'm thinking it's more of a relational thing. It's not like a marriage. We have en- we Israel had entered a marriage with God. God had taken them as his bride. We see that in Hosea, right? The, the idea of the marriage language. What, what other group has been brought into a marriage relationship? The church. Are we not in a marriage relationship with Christ? Have we broken our commitment to our husband? To our head? Can any of us stand before God and say, no, not me? So, much like I put here, they have reaped the curses promised because we have not obeyed Yahweh. Have we obeyed Christ? Have we followed his commands? Pretty simple ones, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love one another as you'd love yourself. These are the commands I leave to you. Can we, on our knees before God, say that I have loved God with all my heart, soul, and mind? Can we, on our knees before God, say I've loved my church, brothers and sisters, as I've loved myself? I love the people in my neighborhood as I love myself. The people that I pass by on the street that I work with as I love myself, can we say that with honesty? So, this idea that there are consequences, there are consequences. So, Daniel seems to be saying that though Israel had gone through the ravages of God's curse, the people remained unchanged, unbroken, unrepentant. Israel has a history of rebellion and idolatry and has suffered God's judgment for it, but it has not driven them to godly grief and genuine repentance. What good will it do to have the people back in the land with still no sense of their sin and no exercise in repentance, who have never been crushed in spirit over their idolatry? It's not Israel alone, but humanity in general is, uh, but humanity in general is adverse to admitting sin. So, and I wrote here, are we any different? When you think about the fact that God lets them go back, not clearly not because they earned it, but because of his covenant faithfulness with the people, like that's just such a picture of the gospel. And you would think that they would be like, oh wow, this king's name is Cyrus. And like, if you understood the scriptures, you'd be like, well, we're, he's going to lead us back and let us build the temple again. Like, all of these promises that were, like, right in their face, face and they're so underwhelmed by them, and we're the same way, that we have all of these promises, that all the answers of God are yes in Christ, that we are in Christ, called to this community, and we see at its best what it looks like in Acts, that's, like, people are getting saved. It's like, wouldn't, wouldn't you give everything if that was your life, that you could be part of this thing that mattered so much more than anything else that you could, you could ever put time in? And we're just like, I don't know, i got to get my kids to stop I gotta make dinner tonight, you know. It's like, I mean, we're so we're underwhelmed too by the gospel. It, it, it's a great personal and corporate challenge, right? Um, you know, and I'll take it even. So we talk about praying for our nation. We only have one day that's a national day of prayer. That's the day I do it. <laughs> <laughs> Check. Come on. I did it. See? Here's the calendar. Here are my invites on my calendar where I did the National Day of Prayer. But doesn't Paul tell us that we should be praying for those that God has put in charge overall? Shouldn't we be praying for our leaders at all times? It's, you know, you hit it, the picture of the gospel. And I'm always brought back to Romans, that that which I shouldn't do is what I do do, and that what I should do, no, I don't do it. But thanks be to God in Christ, 
but thanks be to God in Christ. The difference is we have the mercy and the grace bestowed upon us in Christ Jesus. That God knows, Christ knows that we can't do it in our own power. And there's grace that abounds when sin is present. Because of our need for a Savior, because of our need and our inability to match up to the holiness of God, go back to on your knees, alone before God. In that light, do you look good in the mirror? Well, the modifier can't be, I need to do this, right? Israel can't be like, oh yeah, we need to follow God the way that we should, right? The modifier for us as a people can't be like, yeah, I should be in a group that meets regularly and talks and shares life. But that's, that's the action that's not going to modify. It's, wow, God, in spite of my, you know, my, my lack of uh, trust in following you and beholding you and doing that community and experiencing your grace in you, like, that's where it takes like, Oh, man, I so need this. Uh, oh, God, like, my country needs prayer. I need to be committed to pray for my leaders and my neighbors and my enemies. And it's, if, if it's just, I should do this because that's what good Christians do, or that's what the faithful does, then I will do it for a little while, and I won't do it. But if the modifier is, oh my goodness, God, you've given me so much in spite of how I don't deserve this, I'm so far from you, change my heart, break it to the things that you love. Right? Like that's when that's when bad habits break and God makes a new in you, right? Like from diet to sharing the gospel to whatever, to corporate worship, um, the modifier will always be, I've got to try to do this. Let me try to be a good Christian. Has God ever asked his people to do it in their own strength? No. God said, I will be your God and you will be my people and I will sustain you. All you need to do is obey, follow my rules, and then when you do mess up, I've given you a way to repent. I've given you a way to satisfy that. As a picture for what will come fully reliant on God, washed in the blood of Christ in his presence forever, the ultimate sacrifice, the once-for-all sacrifice. Are we at the point that we understand we're not so good? Amen. Things may be going well for us in our context, but we're not so good. That we need to rely on God as a person, as a church, as a community, as a nation, as a world. That is why the gospel goes from local community outward to the ends of the earth. It is the work of God's people to share the love of God and the message and the mercy of God in Christ. And if we don't bathe that in prayer, if we don't seek that audience with God to understand and have that communion with him, then we are doing it in our own power. And that's what this is all about. Like Daniel goes before God because he wants to tap into the power of God because, look, we've done all these things and I know you've made a promise, but oh my goodness. And that's what brings him to where he ends the prayer with grounded, please grounded in God's character. I'm going to read it. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath Turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for, our, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now, therefore, 
O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy and for your own sake, O Lord. Make your face shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Wow. Okay. What do we notice in, in that? It's interesting that before we looked at how much uh, us and our language is, and now when it's the petition time, the word your shows up like a million times. And I think, at least for me, a lot of the exposure to how we're supposed to pray that, I, that I've had is that when you get to petition, now it's when you talk about your own circumstances and now you're going to ask for your own, you know, your own situation. And when Daniel gets the petition, he doesn't even, I mean, the only mention of circumstances is in light of who God is. So it's, his petition is just to God. It's not about anything else. What is he doing? He's, he's asking for covenant faithfulness, really. Is he, he's kind of reminding God, hey, remember, for your name. It's been funny, he said, pay attention and act. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not funny. It's, it's like, like oh, oh. what? I know. <laughs> I just need one of my kids to say that to me. Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> but I think we look at it that way, but God knows what it is a reflection that Daniel knows what God has promised and that Daniel understands that only because of who God is and what he's promised is there any hope that's really the bottom line here is let's go back we go back to Israel being taken out right everything starts with God's redemption of his people from Egypt a picture of what that ultimate restoration would look like when his people are freed from bondage, freed from their entrapment and misery, and restored to his presence. Does he need to be reminded of that? He did it. But do I understand it? Do I understand that it wasn't just, whew, now I don't have to make bricks anymore. Thank you for that. That it was because of who God is that he made a promise that he would be our God and we would be his people. And that is where the chesed resides. See, prayer is not so much an act as it is an attitude. The attitude of dependency and dependency upon God. God doesn't need to be reminded he knows, but what it shows is that we understand that he did these things and promised these things, and that's where our dependence lies, in the promises of God. Just citing 
what you've done and what we want. We want the end game here. And God, this is your character, so bring us there. Yeah, I think so often it's why me instead of, of course. Yeah, the story. I need you. Mm -hmm. I think of a time particularly, and then I'll share a personal story, just, you know, there was a really tough time I went through, and I remember, um, you are my shield and the lifter of my head. Well, then what am I worried about? We get caught up in our circumstance. We ask why. Did the people ask, why did you send the Babylonians here? Why did you send the Assyrians? Why did you send the Romans? All those things were, those are questions that were asked. The answer really was, I'm God, and you are not. And your dependence is in me, not in your circumstances. It's funny, because we only ask why when it's negative. You know? Why did I why did I get this great job? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no one, said no one ever. Yeah. It's like thank you, I deserve it. Yeah. I it. It's awesome. So I think it I think if you look at this, it's a reminder of our position in prayer is not one of demand. It is one of repentance, it's one of petition and but expectation because we depend on God. And so Daniel's prayer is God centered. And people oriented, right? It's God, you've made these promises to your people. You've made these so he appeals to the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. His people, those who love him. And out of that love, keep his commandments. But when they don't, they love him. And they seek him and they depend on him. So to act for his own name according to his character, his righteousness, and because of his great mercy. And again, I, I, Daniel references God's great act of love and preservation in the Exodus. So we, we've talked about that a number of times. And, and, he, and he leans heavily, right, on that chesed. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath be turned away, right? Um, because we become a byword. Right? Going back to Psalms, right? we become a byword. Now, therefore, O oh God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy, and for your own sake, O oh Lord, make your face shine upon the sanctuary, which is desolate. In other words, bring your presence back to your people. It's because of his name, his righteous acts, that Daniel knows that God will uphold the promises of Scripture. And that he promised he would restore Jerusalem, the sanctuary, and his people. But not all. It was a remnant that was expected to return. And it was a, rem it was a remnant that did. So again, how does this impact us since we are under the righteousness of Christ? And I think we've, we've talked, like, look back. Sins of Daniel and Israel... I don't know that any of us would be free of guilt, even in those same sins. And I wrote here, it would be easy for Daniel to simply call God on his promises. Like, yo, 70 years is coming to an end. Remember what you said. Time to send us home. But Daniel doesn't just rest on, hey, you made me a promise. It's, oh my gosh, we were sent here to be closer to you, and we're not. So, does coming to faith in Christ mean that you have stopped sinning the sins of God's people in the past? Have you stopped having idols in your life? Have you stopped disobeying. Oh. <laughs> Oops! There we go. I stopped being humble. And, I, and I, put, I put Micah in there for a reason. What is it that God requires of you? That you would seek justice. Right? And when you look at justice, 
Justice is caring for others, for the widow, for the disenfranchised, for the orphan. That's when you when you look at justice in the Old Testament and you see the context, it's always in the context of caring for those who cannot care for themselves. So do we love our neighbors as we love ourselves? That's what is expected, that we would love and seek justice, that we would love kindness. But that word is not, I'm going to be really nice to you. That we would love chesed is the word. That we would love God's covenant faithfulness, and as an outpouring of God's covenant faithfulness, that we would share that love with others. That we would continue to build the covenant of love centered solely on Yahweh. And that we would walk humbly before our God. I, I think, I don't know where your heart is, but I will say this, like, this church is one that does. I haven't heard a lot of righteous indignation. There is a humility that, that, that bathes this congregation, that, that bathes this community. But we need to consistently check ourselves. We can get on our high horse. Because we know the truth and because we know Christ, we sometimes make assumptions about others when we should be praying for them. What is it that the world thinks of us? Have we shown the chesed or have we brought the rules? Have we called out the sin without the love? These are all challenges that we have individually, but certainly as a church, as a community, as a nation, and as a world. That coming to faith in Christ means that we are about his work. That we live our lives in light of who he is, not who we are. That could be really bad. Glad you got that. <laughs> so, like Israel, we cannot perform righteousness, right? Because they have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt, and there is none who does good, not even one. Like Israel, we have been given a promise and a better one in Christ. As Moses was li had lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For in this way God loved the world, that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Like Israel, will face consequences for our sin. So let us turn our faces toward God in Christ. Let us confess our personal and corporate transgression. Let us extol the majesty of our Savior, and let us with confidence rest in his promise. Any questions? Wow. No questions. Got kind of preachy there. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, it's not a question, just a comment, but I learned with sackcloth this day. So that's good. All right, good. <laughs> You're going to hit on the, the last part of that chapter? We're going to do that next week. <laughs> that's going to be fun. See, I knew it. <laughs> so, yeah, so next week, um, my plan unless things change, you know, at a providential level, is to, uh, we will cover the 70 weeks prophecy next week. In one week. I mean, <laughs> in one day. <laughs> so we'll, we'll try. Say. We'll try. <laughs> yeah, that was a fun, fun read. We will, um, we'll leave that open, and we'll have, a, we're going to have more of a discussion next week, and look at some things, um, some, like, like I've tried to do, give you different views and, and a holistic look at what the 70 weeks are from different perspectives. And I will let you, with prayer and trembling, come to your own conclusions. I will not try and give you mine. So uh, with that, would someone like to close this today?
close Heavenly Father, you're perfect in all your ways. Every thought, word, deed, action. And we are not. We're so thankful that you sent Jesus to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, and that by believing in him and walking with him and trusting in him alone, we have access to you for all eternity. That is the most amazing grace in the entire universe. And we're just so grateful and thankful, Father. And help us to live out our lives centered on that truth, the truth of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 No, actually, I plan to skip over. <laughs>